Ripple Me This, Riddle Me That has the Phoenix arrived, bringing XRP on its back. Hey folks, Sam I am, and in this episode, we're going to dive into the IMF and the SDR and the whole idea of this global reserve currency and why I think uh, XRP is such, is just far and away a superior asset to the SDR as far as a global reserve currency and why it's eventually inevitable that it will, it will end up replacing the SDR. But let's jump in here by starting with this uh, Rothschild-owned magazine, The Economist. This is the 1998 cover uh, of the magazine. It's talking about get ready for a world currency. Of course, if you look at the coin on the neck, you've got 10, 10, 2018. We just passed that date. And if you're paying attention, you know that's the date the stock market started taking a dive. Okay. And of course, there's dollars at the feet of the Phoenix burning. The Phoenix, you know, burns, turns into ashes, and then is reborn. Uh, and also, look at the logo right here in the center of the coin. Does that look like Saturn to you? Hmm. Okay. So, I've said before that I think the SDR is what the globalists had intended to replace or to become the global world currency. But for a number of reasons that we're going to go into in this video, it has just fallen on its face. It hasn't worked. It's had lots of problems, uh, and we're going to get into all of that. And XRP is really something that's come in, sort of caught them off guard. Uh, it's such a superior asset for everything that they're wanting, but it comes. It's got problems, you know. At least for the globalist, it's not in their control. They can't inflate it at will. Uh, you know, it's just this thing that's leaderless, and it's out there running and working, and everybody. And anybody can use it, uh, and they don't really have, I think, the control over it that they would like to have. And so, on the one hand, uh, when I talk about it's a couple steps forward for the globalists and, and the AML and KYC stuff and being able to monitor all the money movements around the world, uh, that gives the, the state and the establishment and the powers that be more authority over us and and control and power over us but at the same time it's stripping away some of their power in some very very important ways and i think it's setting us up as a species to really evolve beyond central bank control and and government control and so forth um okay so that kind of covers that let's let's start with some of the problems uh this is some russian guy <laughs> i got teased for saying some lady that uh was debating Schwartz or, or David Schwartz earlier. Anyway, uh, this is Putin, and he's talking about problems with the dollar. I'm going to translate for you guys. Uh, he's saying, uh, recently I said that our American friends were kind of shooting themselves in the foot. Uh, they do everything to undermine trust in the dollar as a universal payment instrument. And that's you know just a translation for the global reserve currency, because that's what the dollar is today. <clears throat> says once again it's a typical mistake of empire why because empire is not a curse word and i don't mean to offend or hurt anybody and he's really an ally but he's pointing out that empire always thinks it can afford to make mistakes he's absolutely right with everything that he's saying here or incurring additional costs. It thinks it's so powerful that it can't, that, it, that this won't change anything, but those mistakes and costs keep piling up, and at some point the empire can't deal with them, both in terms of security and the economy, meaning perpetual warfare state and, uh, you know, being able to prop up the economy. Look at everything we've been talking about. Look at the world debt clock. I mean, 21 trillion. They're spending over a trillion dollars a year. This is not sustainable. And as this keeps going up, the more and more of the of the income, if you can call it that, the money they're able to pilfer from uh, their subjects, uh, it has to go towards just paying the interest on this national debt. And so at some point, the whole thing collapses. It, we're, we're pretty much at that point. I mean, they've been kicking the can down the road for decades and decades. And really, the, the chickens are coming home to roost. It's time to pay the piper, whatever, whatever kind of analogy you want to use for it. 
shit's about to hit the fan in a big, big way. And I think what they're going to do as part of this process, and I talked about it a couple videos back, is this idea of the reset. And again, I don't know if it's going to be 10 to 1, you know, looking at the clock and the way that those were, we were doing four hours for every rotation of the minute hand, that's 4 to 12, that may, it, that may be telling us that it's a 30% uh, reduction or devaluation is, is the appropriate word for it. But I think absolutely they're going to jump on the opportunity to wipe some of this debt away and do something here to, to sort of reset the, reset the clock, reset the game. All right, let's go back to Putin. Uh, what, um, That's what our American uh, friends are doing. Uh, you know, we're, they're this empire that thinks they're infallible. They're undermining trust in the dollar as a universal payment instrument and the main reserve currency. And one of the other things I think he might mention it later is the, or, or I skipped over the part, he was talking about Europe is having a huge problem with what's going on. And he's pointing out, so everybody started thinking of a plan B. One of the other problems on the economic side is all of the unfunded liabilities, the pension funds, the social security uh, shortfalls. There's just so many I mean, you look at the budget and then you look at the unfunded liabilities and I mean, it's astronomical. There's no way it's all going to happen. All these other countries see that and they're scared shitless that, you know, they've got their economy, their money, uh, a lot of their wealth tied up in dollar denominated assets. So they're, they're wanting to jump ship too. So here he's talking about EU and Iran. He's pointing out, hey, we don't think Iran violated the terms. The U.S. is just being a big bully. And so, you know, they're wanting to, you know, renew the deal. Or to, the U.S. is wanting to put a stop to it and say, no, you can't do anything with Iran. But the EU's basically giving them, them us, or the U United States government, the finger, saying, no, we're going to do that. And so America's coming back. And they're implementing sanctions. And I've even read an article where they were like threatening to seize assets of board members on uh, SWIFT. <laughs> I mean, this is it's terrorism. If it was any, if it was being done to U.S. Uh, corporations, it would be classified as financial terrorism. But when they do it to everyone else, it's just policy. It's foreign policy, <laughs> folks. So these companies don't want to lose the profits from these sanctions, but companies that aren't restricted by the U.S. markets will gladly continue, but we need different payment methods and our global trade system apart from SWIFT, which is the global current global transaction system. That's why more and more companies choose national currency payments. And he's pointing out, rightly so, that when you do that, though, because, you know, oil is such a huge, um, huge dollar figure, it creates a lot of volatility and a lot of problems. That's the whole point of having this global reserve currency <clears throat> that's much, much bigger than anything you're doing in one currency. But oil consumption is a pretty good chunk of, of GDP for most countries. So that's what he's pointing out. It creates problems. So they created BRICS, and he's talking about they're trying to create some, some insurance policies and some financial instruments to help deal with that. BRICS is, I think, Brazil, uh, Russia, India, China, something. And then here he's saying, this is very important, the capabilities of our banks so far can't be compared to the ones of the IMF. And he's specifically right there talking about the SDR. But we're working on it. So they want to get the hell out of Dodge. They want to get away from the dollar. They want to get away from SWIFT. And this is not just Russia. I mean, this is a lot of Europe. This is Russia. This is a lot of the rest of the world. They're getting fed up with this bully that's going around exporting its inflation to their country 
giving them this asset that has all these unfunded liabilities that could literally collapse at any moment and leave them really in a bad, bad place. So uh, resistance is building. And that's, that's what I want you to see from here. So there he's talking about insurance and hedging instruments in order to stabilize the local currencies. Because what you've had happen over the last several years is Russia and China are trading oil in rubles or buying oil in rubles and so forth. There's all kinds of these partnerships, whereas before it was always, always, always you buy dollars first, then you buy the oil, then you, uh, the other party, the selling party sells the dollars and gets whatever local currency they need. That's given tremendous uh, utility and strength to the dollar, but all that is coming undone. They're saying it won't happen overnight. Now, this is important. Our oil and gas companies aren't ready to give up dollar payments and switch to national currencies because of that volatility. What have we heard Ripple talking about over and over? That you put your dollars or your euros or whatever currency you have, plug them into RippleNet and you get oil out the other end. This is, this is where that's going. If we manage to de-dollarize our trade and get rid of the volatility of national currencies, we will move in that direction. As soon as that happens, the dollar as a universal payment unit will have a difficult time, i.e. it will be finished, period, game over. <laughs> we'll see how it goes. <laughs> but that's, that's where, that's where Russia is going and a big chunk of the world. BRICS, that's what it's all about. So, you know, resistance is mounting. Uh, this has been happening, unfolding over decades, folks. So, you know, it's nothing new in the last year or two, anything like that. It's been a long time problem. It's coming to a head, though. And I think a lot of people see that. Now, let's go back to Christine Lagarde uh, and listen to her talk about the SDR and some of the changes that are coming about because of DLT, cryptocurrency, and so forth. The talk was this notion of a borderless activity mm. as distinct from a sort of bordered entity. And taking that on, um, presumably, if we are indeed, as it sounds plausible, moving to this world of a borderless activities, that must presumably strengthen the case for us being coordinated and joined up internationally when it comes to getting our arms around regulating and supervising those yeah. borderless activities. Yeah, and in a way that, that, has, that has begun. Yeah. Uh, when, when, when you have all these discussions about the home country and the host country and what part of the regulation applies and, and how you segment the activity and where you expect the reserves to be. Mm. And okay, now as we're listening to this, I want you to remember what I've said and what the, the uh, Bearable Guy 123 decoder has talked about with regulations and how in some countries it's absolutely required, but that it's all worked out. And I think that this right here is exactly what they were referencing when they were kind of explaining some of that to us. Uh, she's specifically talking about cross-border payments right here. The, and, the, and the capital and so on and so forth. But I think it's actually moving one or two steps further uh, than purely home host, because at least in the home host, you, you have entities, uh, either legal or branches of uh, existing legal entities. So you have a way to sort of put, put your arms around these, these uh, uh, animals. Cross-border transfers uh, supported by um, digital technologies will be far more difficult to apprehend. And, and I think will require rethinking of the of the regulatory 
um, environment and, and the legal rules under which it will be defined. You know, because clearly there is a division of labor in some countries between what is actually securities and what is deposit, to, to put it at, at the most simplistic way. And what is a security and what is a deposit in the context of digital assets? And she's talking about how those definitions are going to be relaxed and not going to be as firm as they are today. Regula regulatory changes are absolutely required in some cases to implement this, is what Bearable Guy 123 Decoder has explained to us over and over again. So, and here we are. This is Christine Lagarde explaining this almost exactly a year ago from today. And that border uh, might very well be, uh, be less, less obvious and, uh, and decisive than it is at the moment. Perfect. Let's go to the audience, given that time is... <laughs> Can start the front with Manoush. Can I, uh, while the mic is, mm. is coming, I just want to, li I'd like to make one, one, other, one additional point. I think it's going to be, um, you know, what's happening at the moment, if, if you look at the, 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 the sort of, the economy of that market, assuming that the financial activities can be defined as a market, I think it's a very, very particular market, which is associated with guarantees and with, with exorbitant privilege, uh, in, in, certainly for some currencies. Uh, but what's the happening is a massive disruption uh, in the making caused by innovations or compounded innovations. And as in any market disruptions, uh, there will be uh, innovation, there will be productivity improvements, and there will be, you know, sort of shock to the existing business models yes. to which current institutions and entities will be trying to resist either by okay in the current institution she's talking about the federal the reserve banks federal reserve and so forth in all the different countries as well as the big banks like chase manhattan and and some of the others around the world um they have everything to lose because they're the ones who are who have the scale to interconnect into these global payment systems and all of these other smaller institutions have to come to them, pay these exorbitant fees uh, and just deal with whatever kind of bullshit they want to throw at them. And they don't really have any choice. So they are the ones on the top, you know, higher up on the pyramid and everybody else has to come to them. And that, that thing's about to get flattened out. That's what she's referencing. Trying to build you know, territories, mm. trying to raise barrier to entry. Mm. Uh, and, you know, I talked about them, the chase wanting to batten down the hatches. That's exactly what she's describing. Trying to seek protection from the central bank, for instance, or else, rather than be cannibal. And, you know, running to seek protection from the central banks, go, you know, go to them for regulation, for uh, some kind of privilege that only the big banks are going to get that the smaller players won't have access to you know just it's not it, they don't want a level playing field period they're not going to be the first ones who are running to ripple beating down their door because they have everything to lose and very little to gain in fact it's going to be a survival game for a lot of them cannibalize themselves they will want to cannibalize I mean, I don't know how you put it in English, but in, instead of being cannibalized by others, they will cannibalize themselves by actually moving in that field of, uh, of, of digital uh, world, uh, including virtual currencies. So I think that's, it, it's really important for central banks to not play that game of please protect our turf, failing which uh, we could cause a risk to financial stability. I think there is a trade-off between financial stability, which would be part of the mandate, or price stability, rather, uh, and, and lending uh, an excessive protectionist arm to those who are under competition because of that disruption. In other words, if these smaller players, you know, I've talked about the cargo ship versus the speedboat. The cargo ship needs a half mile and two hours to make a U-turn. The speedboat can do it in five seconds and 20 feet, right? So they're just going to be so much faster to respond and to, to create uh, products and services that fill these needs 
whereas the big oil tankers, the Chase Manhattans, the Federal Reserve, the, the central banks around the world are going to want to batten down the hatches, keep the status quo as long as they can, uh, and they're not going to be able to respond in the same way. And in doing so, they could end up undermining uh, the their their local currencies, I think is what she's describing. Uh, you know, if the, basically a, a, if there's this better digital asset that the central banks are kind of shunning, but the people realize it and start running to it in droves, that's going to cause price instability in, you know, let's use the example of the dollar. Uh, on top of everything else that's going on with the world trying to get rid of the dollars and not use it as the global reserve currency. So she's she's basically pointing out, uh, you know, the, the money ball example that a digital asset investor gave us, innovate or die, innovate or die central banks. That's that's your choice. Innovate or die Chase Bank. I completely agree. I mean, we've seen plenty of destructive destruction in finance. It'd be yep. nice to have some creative uh, as well, actually, and that mm. speaks exactly to your point. Manoush. Christine, I wanted to ask you to say a bit more about the role of the IMF's special drawing rights. In the original vision of Keynes and Bretton Woods, they thought that the SDR would play a much bigger role in the international monetary system. Do you think the digital age creates an opportunity to rethink the role of the SDR in, as an international currency? You know, this is really open territory here because it's, um, it has been around for a long time. There were high expectations. There were actually issuance uh, in, in special drawing rights for a period of time. Then it was abandoned. That didn't work out very well. Uh, there was a pickup lately after the renminbi was included in the basket of currencies. Uh, has it been a massive pickup? No. Uh, by pickup, she means utility. People actually using the SDR for trade and commerce and so forth hasn't worked. It's fallen flat on its face. Everything that they've tried to push people to do with the SDR has been a failure. I think that the, the digital platform uh, and the distributed ledger technologies can actually facilitate something which will otherwise be of a political nature. Of a political nature, meaning a global reserve currency that's controlled by one government. And the, that's the reason I showed you uh, Putin first. He's explaining, and he's an ally, uh, he's explaining that the U.S. government is shooting itself in the foot. They're scaring the shit out of everybody that's being forced to use this dollar as a global reserve currency. We're scrambling to put alternatives together so that we can get the hell away from these uh, lunatics who are just spending beyond their means. They're not funding their liabilities and they're, they're basically heading for absolute disaster. So that's what she means by political nature. Okay. And I think if the go, if the two were to come together, the digital acceleration and facilitation and the geopolitical situation that would be propitious to relying on an alternative basket of currencies that would not be a substitute for existing uh, international international currency is so she says with a question mark <laughs> and this is where I disagree with her I, I think she's gone off the rails here uh, if you didn't understand that you know I'll, I'll put the links in the video you can go back and watch this section like five times and it may start to make sense that's what it's taken for me um, but she's pointing out you get this digital asset in there as the reserve currency uh, and then you pair that with these uh, with the SDR as it exists today, which is or some form of baskets of local currencies. But then I think right there it kind of dawned on her. Well, <laughs> why would you need these local currencies if you have this digital asset that's out there? And again, this is a year old. They're their opinion and thinking on this has probably evolved and I think they've probably realized what I'm trying to kind of share with you guys and let, let you guys understand that XRP is far and away the superior asset than any basket of currencies with fixed five-year ratios that they can come up with. We're going to keep going into that a little bit, but it, she, she stumbled there because she, she's, 
got some problems, some issues with her logic, and she's recognizing that right on stage, and that's what she just kind of acknowledged in front of the audience. It was fantastic. Um, but I think it, it, you, we would need the two together. No, you wouldn't. Um, it's not a far-fetched hypothetical, and I believe that at the fund we just have to be ready for that should the circumstances arise that would facilitate the whole process. So, some kind of crisis, i.e. the global reset that I've shown you, she's gone around talking about, that we will roll this whole thing out. And, okay, so I guess, you know, I've talked about this two-tiered system. So, XRP is the global reserve currency over the, you know, kind of planet-wide uh, anybody that needs to do FX exchanges, it's not, you know, the FX markets as they exist today are going to be radically uh, altered once XRP gets rolled out and, and utility starts flowing through it. There's not going to be really much need for them. You're just going to buy XRP and then trade it in for whatever you need, be it oil, ga natural gas, or some uh, current local fiat currency. So in that sense, they will be still paired together, but the idea that you would have XRP as the global reserve asset and then still this, this made-up basket of currencies with fixed five-year ratios to somehow uh, pair in with that is utter nonsense. And I think she realizes it and just hasn't put all the pieces together yet. Thank you. I'm going to take two more questions. Okay. Wait. And that was it for there. Now we're going to go back to this one, and I've shown you guys this video before. Uh, this is long, but it's a great, great overview and really kind of a deep dive on the SDR. I love this interview interviewer. He's very sharp, asked some great questions. This guy's kind of a, a dick. Uh, and this guy's a current, he's, he's former Swift. This guy's current Swift. Uh, so we're just going to watch this a little bit. Explain to our audience not all of whom, and maybe not most of whom are not economists, just to explain to them conceptually how, how the SDR came about and how it's evolved in terms of its role. Now, I want to read the, the definition that the fund has, which I think is pretty concise, but still it's fairly ethereal. Uh, the SDI is neither a currency nor a claim on the IMF, rather is a potential claim on the freely usable currencies of IMF members. Um, so could you talk about the inception of the SDR and how its use came to evolve over time? Uh, I, I can and will if Tom uh, doesn't wish to take that since you're the active guy at the fund. Oh, you can go ahead and, and then I, I supplement. <laughs> okay. It's fine. Uh, w when the SDR was created, the, the, the dollar was still fixed to, to gold. Internationally, not domestically. But remember we talked about a couple of videos back how that changed because all of the gold was getting emptied out of the United States vaults, and so they had to close the gold window. So one SDR was valued at one dollar, which was valued whose value was fixed to gold. Uh, it was only a couple of years when all of that fell apart, and the Second Amendments to the Articles then uh, significantly changed how the fund operated and its its rules. And so, so that the SDR plan didn't work. Then became a basket. I thought I thought it was sixteen currencies, but you, you said 20, uh, maybe it was 20, but it was a lar large number but that didn't of work. currencies. Now it's that five. Then subsequently reduced. But from, 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 the, from the Second Amendment, which is what acknowledged the end of the gold standard, uh, the purpose of the SDR was to supplement, at a minimum, if not ultimately replace nationally issued reserve currencies. And that has the benefits that. If you didn't catch that, that's global reserve currency. Replace the dollar as the global reserve currency so that you've got this overarching thing. But again, the problem is it's okay. So it's not politicized in terms of the U S government can, gets to control it or the British empire gets to control it. But it's, still, it's even worse because it would be the IMF, so the globalists would get to control it and manipulate it and so forth. Whereas now, Ripple has come in uh, with this kind of almost brilliant sneak attack and nobody controls it. 
the the markets control it. The individuals using it are the ones who get to really have the biggest say in in how it's used and what it's used for. I enumerated earlier. And has that changed over time in any way? I mean, can you talk a little bit uh, about the crisis issue, the crisis related emissions and how that was a different, because that seemed to have happened in a different context, context than the previous uh, two rounds, right? Okay, maybe just before I get there, just a few things on the rules, and I mean, you already read it out. Notwithstanding this very nice picture, in some ways, I, I would say nobody has ever seen an SDR. <laughs> so it is a virtual, just it is made it up early case of a virtual currency, SDRs, when they are issued. And by that same token, because it's just something they're inventing out of thin air, if they want to create more, they could just do that. With XRP, nobody gets to just go out and create more. It's a fixed number. They don't control it, and it's actually a decreasing. It's a deflationary asset because the fees are getting burned. So it's, you know, there's less and less, meaning if with the same amount of utility, uh, in the individual XRP is going to be worth increasingly, you know, small incremental amounts more than it is today. They are allocated to members, to IMF members in the SDR department, that is all IMF members, and they are allocated in, percent, in proportion to their quotas. So the U.S. gets the most and so on. I, I think that will be important later on when we think you know, how does this system actually work? You cannot use SDRs directly, but they give you, for most purposes, but they give you a right to exchange into a freely usable currency, as, as your quote also said. So you can change the SDRs when you need them, for example, to pay imports, you can get dollars in exchange for the SDRs. So you can cash them in for fiat. Now. There was originally in 69, as Warren also said, there was a, when it was created, a reason was there was a worry about global liquidity. There isn't sufficient foreign exchange assets around. Um, and, this and this is the same thing uh, Putin and talked about in the beginning. You know, if you want to move all the oil stuff into local currencies, you get wild price swings and that causes all kinds of problems. So you need this sort of overriding asset uh, in order to quell that problem. And the SDR is what they, uh, I guess, developed with that in mind as, as that use case is something they wanted to solve. This again came to the fore during the global crisis. I think in particular the G20 took the lead at the time how to respond and stabilize the system. And even today with the, the recent capital outflows from emerging markets, there's a lot of focus. Correct. On, on I, the I think right? that is now resurfacing again with sort of renewed tension. So, but maybe the 2009 might help briefly to explain also some of the problems. So there was agreement to have a big SDR allocation as part of a package. It was $250 billion. Um, as I said, Just said it was 10 times the previous. Outcome. Yes, so of the currently we have about 204 billion SDR, so less than 300 billion dollars in SDRs are actually out there, and 180 some of were created in 2009. So the vast majority. It's it's 10 times all previous yeah, allocations yeah, combined. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but <clears throat> what? So if you didn't catch that, they created like 10 times the amount of SDRs and put them out in order to hopefully get the various countries around the world using it for to solve the problem of global liquidity. And it fell on its face. I, if I heard the numbers right, it's like 1% of it actually got used. The rest just got locked away and stored. Okay happened then so the idea was this would help countries really because it provides reserve assets to the member countries during the crisis in effect very few countries used much of the sdr so in the initial six months roughly three billion of that sdr was only really used in in other words exchanged for a currency and did that come as a surprise to you guys as you expected? 
So right there it is. Three billion of the three hundredths of one percent is is what they had a one percent utility rate. That sounds like Bitcoin to me. A bit as a surprise, but I think looking back, probably it shouldn't because it is actually it isn't a currency you can use straight out. Right. So there are restrictions. You can only also exchange it. Liquidity restraint by definition, right? By so the, yeah, yes. Absolutely brilliant. Here, here, governments, we've created this liquidity tool for you that has all these liquidity restrictions placed on it artificially by us. So that should solve the problem, right? It's government thinking for you. But this being said, I still think it played a useful role because the headline reserves, I mean, this was potentially something low-income countries, other countries could use. And for low-income countries, those from in the fund, it's almost 10% of their FX reserves in 2009. So it's not a small number for those countries. Would it be comparable to something like a standby IMF facility where it's like you're not really tapping it, but <laughs> investors are happy to know it's there? Sort of thing. Maybe that... to a precaution. It's, so it's a right that you can use, but you are also getting at another issue. It's an unconditional right. So yeah. if South Africa wants to pay for more inputs, it can draw on its on its SDRs, but it doesn't require that country to make any policy adjustment. So There's I think no, that is... You don't have to go into a deficit. And so yeah, on. or you or don't print, have to, money or if, if it is appropriate, for example, to tighten fiscal policy or do other policy adjustments, that is often a worry against more issuance of SDRs, that it gives countries sort of unconditional liquidity and it may delay potentially uh, policy adjustments. I, I would like to correct one impression you might have gotten. SDRs can be used directly. They do not have to be ex uh, exchanged for currency to make a payment. In, in yeah. fact, payment of charges to the fund on fund programs must be in SDRs. They're not converted into a currency. You just pay SDRs. The reason they are most often converted into currencies is that the, the recipient doesn't particularly want to get SDRs. Gee, and, I wonder why. That's a part of the issue of how uh, broader use and demand for them Dollars could don't be have those restrictions. And, uh, addressed. So your point Euros is if don't there have were those private restrictions. Issuance, that would create the sort of liquidity. It would help enormously. That would make it more attractive for people to hold this. Yeah. Right. If if you priced oil internationally in SDRs, the default settlement currency would be SDRs. You know, you might still settle in dollars, euros, or something else, but the default currency would be SDRs. It would it would give a little impetus. So here they are once again, <laughs> trying to put force all the oil companies to switch over to the reserve asset to this SDR thing that they can just create out of thin air and trust us. We're going to, we're going to adjust it and we're going to keep it all, you know, good and everything. You, you just need to start using it for us. And by the way, it comes with all these restrictions that the dollar doesn't, but it's better. It's better for you. Trust us. This for people to have the SDRs with which to pay them, but these are private transactions. So these would have to be private SDRs, not the one allocated by, by the IMF. Can we talk a little bit about China's uh, accession to... Okay, so you get the idea. You can go and watch this. It's it's long, it's boring, but it's pretty informative. It, it gives you a good historical overview and kind of just overview of the IMF and the SDR and so forth. Uh, I, I really learned a lot watching this. And I just want to kind of maybe try and explain why now, you know, given all the context that we've just gone through, why XRP would be such a superior asset so to to the SDR and why I think and again we don't we don't really have like a lot of the Temenos and SAP and uh, you know some of these other things that are coming on the horizon. There's a lot of indicators, there's conference slides, there's demos, there's all these things that kind of point to this happening, but this is all national security stuff and working with central banks and happening behind closed doors. We really don't have anything, but, you know, being former uh, technical pre-sales, a solution architect, I've sat in meetings like this where you sit down, you listen to the customer pain points. You've got your solution that you know really well in the, in, you know, in the back of your mind and you're trying to match up 
solutions to pain points. And, uh, you know, if I went into a meeting like this, it would be a slam dunk. Okay. And here's why you've got all these countries out there and let's go, you know, five years down the road, the central banks have adopted XRP for uh, value exchange on a global level. It is the global reserve asset. It's leveled the playing field. We've removed the politics like uh, Chris, uh, you know, removed it from political manipulation by any one government or groups of governments. Um, and, you know, it's constantly 24-7, 365 days a year being moved around all over the globe between all of these uh, hundreds of different countries around the planet versus the SDR, which is five countries. So I know the United States, China, uh, I think Japan, uh, Great Britain, and I forget who the other one is. It doesn't matter. Um, and they, they, it's a fixed ratio. So they come back and reevaluate that and make adjustments every five years. So let's say that, uh, a big earthquake or a tsunami or my favorite, uh, Godzilla comes out of the Pacific ocean and just lays waste to Japan and their economic output is reduced by 80%. Okay. Well, that's a huge chunk of um, value that's all of a sudden lost. And, you know, if it's, if it's a big natural disaster or something like that, it's going to be six months, 12 months before that economic activity is returned. If it's really something that's devastating. And I'm kind of, we're using a larger case here to, to make it, make the point easier for you to understand and, and really see. But what would happen in that scenario is a lot of those products and services, manufacturing, whatever was going on there would move to China. Some of it would go to Mongolia. Some of it would go to Russia, no doubt. I, I mean, it, it would just get distributed around the globe as all of the consumers of the things that Japan was producing scrambled to find different sources, uh, different places that could fulfill those same needs. Um, and so in the case of S of the SDR, all of that utility, all of that value, that GDP just drops off the map and it's gone. And it's like, it, it just disappears right out of the SDR. In the case of XRP, uh, there's a temporary disruption because you know, all that economic activity just simply falls off. But very soon, because all of these other countries, you know, if you're a business in the United States buying something from Japan and all of a sudden that's gone and all of a sudden you're getting it from France, let's say, well, that money flow is going to pick up and increase in, you know, between France and the United States for whatever level it was that it has shifted. So in that sense, XRP is a basket of all the countries, all the different currencies, and their ratios are constantly being adjusted 24 seven based on their utility. Okay. That's so important that you understand that. So with the SDR, you've got five currencies, a fixed ratio that gets adjusted every five years. If you know, the tsunami or Godzilla lays waste to Japan, it basically disappears. It's going to go, that economic activity is going to move and be dispersed among other countries, but those countries aren't in the basket of the five currencies, or not all of it would be. I mean, some of it's, a lot of it's going to go to China, I would imagine. But still, you get the idea. Whereas with XRP, because it has this global utility to transfer value all across the planet, it's just going to shift over time and rebalance itself. And it is also constantly rebalancing itself as you know, people are exchanging value. Uh, you have, you know, all of these individual actors in the marketplace exchanging value, exchanging ideas, goods and services and so forth. And so there is no need to create the basket. The basket is everyone that uses it. There is no need to create the ratios. The ratios are determined by their utility and, you know, by how much uh, dollars are getting traded in for XRP and vice versa and how much rubles are getting traded in. For XRP and vice versa. And, and you know, that's happening 24 seven, the markets are handling it, there is no overarching authority. 
And in the event of a natural disaster or just fluctuations over time, XRP is going to continually and constantly adjust and give you the absolute best balance because it's just, it encompasses so much more than the SDR ever, ever could. So when I look at this and I hear, you know, the pain points that we just went over from Christine Lagarde, from these current and former uh, IMF officials and so forth, and from Russia saying, you know, SWIFT has got to go, the U.S. dollar's got to go, we're, we're fed up with this shit. It's clear as day to me that XRP is going to replace the SDR, and this is what I base it on. So do I have facts, irrefutable proof that this is happening and it's underway? No. But is it clear as day to me, looking at the problem, looking at what they've tried to, to, to get the SDR to be, uh, and what XRP is and is turning into very quickly. Absolutely. Absolutely. I think it's a no brainer. I think it's inevitable. I don't know when it's going to happen, but I think it should be a foregone conclusion, especially once we start to hear announcements of central banks adopting XRP for cross-border payments and, and value exchange. Okay. Probably a long one. I don't even know how long I've been babbling on, but hope that gave you some insights. Uh, the most fascinating part to this is really this right here. You know, the globalists like to sort of forecast things out. And they told us 30 years ago, 10, 10, 2018, uh, we've got something coming. It's big. I don't think it's what they wanted. And that's what I talk when I talk about, you know, a couple steps back, one step forward, we're, we're, it's a huge step that we're taking. It's a very important one. Yes, we're losing some ground. Yes, they're gaining some ground. But I think it's it's Laputa, folks. It's marking the beginning of the end for the empire, for the globalist, for this era of the central banks. Eventually, these startups and, and just people getting more comfortable and getting closer to the technology and it becoming more integrated and available in their daily lives is going to throw out this old antiquated system of control and dominance and replace it with something that's, uh, you know, far more friendly and usable and helpful to individuals, far more fair. It's the level playing field that we heard Trump talk about, you know, all of it rolled up into one big changes coming. Uh, that's what I got. We'll see you next video. <laughs>